How can the Jets work around Brees Hall's injury? How much pressure should be on Mike LaFleur? Should the Jets have done more at the trade deadline? We'll discuss all this and more on today's mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. This is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. Thanking you for making the show your first listen or first watch every day. This podcast is free and it's available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or hear, hit the subscribe button wherever you are watching or listening. You'll never miss an episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. Helps the channel out and it helps other Jets fans find the podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is presented by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. Just pick two to five players, and if they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. First time user- users can receive a 100% instant deposit match with up to $100 using promo code LOCKED ON. Again, that's prizepicks.com, promo code LOCKED ON. Today we have our weekly mailbag. It comes after the trade deadline, a quiet trade de- deadline for the Jets. We talked about the possibilities yesterday. The Jets only made one move. It was a minor move as they traded Jacob Martin to Denver. So on yesterday's show, I said I felt like the Jets should be moderate buyers. I guess you could say they were kind of moderate sellers, although I don't think the trade of Jacob Martin really indicates they were selling. Jacob Martin's just kind of become a, the odd man out with the emergence of Bryce Huff, and you got Jermaine Johnson coming back and Michael Clemens returning to the team. So essentially the Jets sent Jacob Martin and a 2024 fourth, fifth round pick to Denver, and then they got back a 2024 fourth round pick. So essentially it's Jacob Martin plus a five for a four. And you, so essentially you move up around by trading Jacob Martin and the Jets get a little bit of cap relief for a player who was again, kind of the odd man out. So minor move, I think a move that's logical for the Jets, but the Jets do not upgrade their roster at the trade deadline, which as I said yesterday, no real surprise. It was an active, it was for the NFL. It was an active trade deadline period, but not a whole lot happening by the standards of other sports compared, at least comparatively. So let's move into our weekly mailbag. Each Wednesday, we try and do a mailbag show with listener questions. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. And we'll begin with a question about Brees Hall. John, I'm sure most of the questions you get this week will be about Zach. Personally, while the mistakes he made were egregious, I think they're easily fixable. I'm not overly concerned. My concern is about Brees Hall. It really seemed like when he had success, it was running the offense around him and his explosive playmaking ability. How do you think this offense can find success with him out for the year? Also, I know it's too early to say, but I'm just looking for a little bit of hope. Do you see a possibility where he returns week one playing at the level we saw the last few weeks? Well, the, as far as the last question goes, will he return at full strength? Will he be back week one? I'm not a doctor, so I can't say that. Uh, what we do know is the Jets are very optimistic about his ability to be healthy for next year or so. It doesn't sound like there, there's a lot of concern. It sounds like there's a lot of optimism with the Jets that he'll be back for 2023 and look like the way he did the last couple of weeks while he was playing. How did the Jets replace Brees Hall? Well, you don't replace Brees Hall with one guy. And I think the mistake would be to think that Michael Carter is going to step in and be Brees Hall or that the James Robinson trade was going to fix everything that was wrong with the offense now that... and. It's a question at the running back position of whether it's a weakness. There's a difference between something not being a weakness and it being an overwhelming strength. And that's kind of like what we saw at the corner position. When the Jets drafted Sauce Gardner during the offseason, a lot of people said, well, corner wasn't a weakness. Why did we do that? Well, it's because Sauce turned it into an overwhelming strength, the type of strength that stifles opponents, that overwhelms the opposition. You're kind of going in the opposite direction with Brees, where now you have two guys who are solid but it's gone from being an overwhelming strength to being a spot where you have a couple decent guys where it's not a weakness. And there's a difference there. It's not as good. It's not as dynamic. I do think in the long run, James Robinson, that trade is going to help the Jets. I think he's a good player. I also think Michael Carter is a good player, despite the numbers not looking so great at this point. I think the Jets have two solid backs, and James Robinson's going to be an upgrade over Ty Johnson. I really do believe that. But you're not going to get as much from the running game. 
And this was going to be true no matter what, but the Jets really need to get more from the passing game. And, you know, you saw spurts of it on Sunday. They did throw for over 350 yards in the game against New England. So you started to see the Jets get more from the passing game. But, you know, there are a couple of layers here. You need somebody to step up and be the go-to guy. And on Sunday, that was Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson really stepped up in that game and looked like the, the Garrett Wilson of week two. And it seemed to me like he's kind of been Zach Wilson's, especially without Corey Davis in the lineup, he's now the Zach Wilson's guy, the guy he looks to in the key spots. So on that level, you need somebody you force the defense to account for. Garrett Wilson looked like he was that guy week two. He's again looked like it last week. And once Brees gets back, now you could have two guys like that. You could have two go-to guys on offense, which makes an offense more dangerous. So somebody's got to step into that role and become like the go-to guy. That's Brees. Generally speaking, the passing game is going to have to carry more of the load. Again, it was going to have to anyway, you know, a couple weeks where the Jets threw for under 125 yards leading into Sunday. That's not sustainable. It's not even like it's on it's not even like it's unsustainable if you're if you want to win games. It's just unsustainable to throw for that little. The question is how much it's going to improve. And while there were issues with turnovers on Sunday, you did see the passing game come to life to at least a certain extent. So that's a positive. That that's clearly, you know, a, a positive. I think there are still issues with this passing game, but you need to get more out of Elijah Moore. And the Jets I, I've said it, and I, I'm not sure it was a popular thing to say, but heading into that Denver game, I did a podcast where I said, you know something? These two sides may not like each other right now. There may be issues in this relationship. This may not even be a relationship that survives the offseason. But for right now, the Jets don't have a better option. And if Elijah Moore wants to be in the NFL, he's got to play for the Jets and do a good job. So Elijah Moore, that's a guy who's got to step up. But you got to get, it's just one of those things when your top guy goes down, it's not like you're going to like have a new top guy walk through the door. You just need everybody to be better. So that means, you know, the running backs are going to have to elevate their game a little bit. Garrett Wilson may need to step into that role as go-to guy. Elijah Moore's got to step up. The tight ends, you know, Conklin played well on Sunday. Uh, um, You know, Conklin, who's been horrible, uh, actually had a really good game on Sunday. He looked like the guy who the Jets gave that contract to. He looked like the guy they were expecting when they signed him from Minnesota. So anything you get from the tight ends is a big step up from what you had in the past. And, of course, Zach Wilson. I mean, it's clear Zach's just got to do better. He was better, I guess, from the standpoint that there were some plays that were made. Now, part of it was the receiver stepped up, and Denzel Mims made a really big catch in the fourth quarter of that game where it was, I mean, it was, most, it was mostly Mims. So there's another guy who could step up. But it's just... I think it's just one of those situations where everybody's got to do a little bit more without Brees in the lineup because he was such a dynamic force that there, there really are not many Brees Halls in, in this league. And to the extent there were, there are, they're not available in trades. So, you know, there's no easy answer. This team's not as good without Brees Hall as they were with Brees, but everybody just needs to step up a little bit more than they've been doing. And that's especially true this weekend where the Jets play a tremendous Buffalo defense. Next question. Trade deadline was a snore fest. What trades would you have liked to have seen happen in an alternate reality? Well, I'm guessing this is not guys who were, were actually traded. Miami dealing a first round pick plus for Bradley Chubb without having a new contract in place. I, I would not have loved that. You know, Brad, Bradley Chubb was a guy who interested me, but not, not giving up a first round pick with a new contract in place. So I guess if we're dealing in a purely alternate reality, I'd have to go Laramie Tunsil because he's the type of guy, and I don't think I did, I did not think he was available because, first of all, it makes no sense for Houston to trade a tackle in their prime in his prime, even as you're rebuilding. Because if you're rebuilding, one of the first building blocks you want is a tackle in your prime in this prime. So that's like a when you're starting over, when you're hitting the reset button, you're not probably not going to trade that guy. But also, the cap implications just would have made it impossible for Houston. But hypothetically. A player like that, if he was available, and maybe more realistically, it could have been a Jack Conklin from Cleveland. But again, I'd want an extension in place if I'm giving up something good. But if you can get like a long-term tackle, those are not easy to find in the NFL. And the Jets have shown you that because the Jets have tried to find long-term tackles, and they've really struggled. And it's not just to help Zach Wilson. It's just a piece of team building, finding cornerstone offensive line guys. And that's one of the reasons Elijah Vera Tucker's performance has been so important this year. And I know we're not going to see AVT for the rest of the year, but 
the fact that you know maybe he can go out and play tackle now it's a huge boost to this team and it feels like the jets found one of their core pieces on the offensive line now if you can go out and get if you they could have gotten out gone out and gotten another one that would have been nice but i did not see any great offensive lineman who changed teams so i'm not criticizing the jets but if you're asking me what in an ideal world would have happened that's it now head here on the locked on jets podcast we'll continue our mailbag show we'll talk about mike lafleur he's getting a lot of the blame should he be getting a lot of the blame what should he be doing that's what we'll discuss as we continue this wednesday mailbag one thing that is going well this year for the jets is the performance of their defense they're doing a great job defending their turf now you probably want to defend your home and if you've thought about securing your home with home security but have been putting it off, you'll want to listen up. Right now, Locked On Jets listeners can order the number one rated Simply Safe home security system for 50% off. This is their biggest offer of the year, and you won't want to miss it. In an emergency, 24 7 professional monitoring agents use Fast Protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real so you can get priority police response. Simply Safe is whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door, HD security cameras for inside and out, smarter ways to detect motion that, ele- that alert you when a threat is real, and even hazard sensors that detect fires, floods, and other threats to your home. 24 7 professional monitoring service costs less than $1 a day, less than half the price of ADT's traditional professionally installed system. So don't miss your chance to save big on this security system. Get 50% off the new Simply Safe system at simplysafe.com slash locked on today. This is their biggest discount of the year, so don't wait. That's Simply Safe, S I M P L I S A F E dot com slash locked on NFL. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Thank you again for making Locked On Jets your first listen or first watch every day. This podcast is free and it's available on all platforms. We continue with our weekly mailbag. Our next question is about Mike LaFleur. Why do you think that Mike LaFleur has not drawn up more run pass options and bubble screens with these receivers? Do you think he's holding a grudge against Elijah Moore? I don't understand why he's calling deeper routes. He needs to help Zach out with easier throws earlier in the game. What do you think the depth chart will look like after the bye? Do you think Mims has earned the right to move up the roster and get more playing time? So a lot to unpack there. Why has Mike LaFleur not drawn up more run pass options and bubble screens? Um, I think he should do it a little, little bit more. I think that there have been moments where Zach Wilson has maybe gotten a little bit rattled. And in those situations, you want to make sure your quarterback has an easy throw to get him back into rhythm, to regain his confidence. So I think he should be doing that a little bit more. Now, the Jets' run pass option rate is higher this year. But I think this is an offense that you know is based off a lot of play action. The Jets have been doing that at a fair clip. So I think that, yeah, they probably, especially the issues Zach Wilson's having with his reads in the pocket, they might want to dial up more plays that are easier to execute. But it's really difficult to do it in the NFL to move the ball if you have a passing game that's simplified. At some point, you need, do need your quarterback to win from the pocket. So I do think there's more the Jets can be doing to help Zach Wilson out. But, you know, I, and I, listen, I think they should be more throwing more screens to Elijah Moore. Listen, I don't know what's going on with Elijah Moore. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, the only thing I'll say is what I said after Sunday's game. Elijah Moore is either a, such a huge problem that he's got to go away from the team or you can stand having him on the team. And you have to pick one of the two. And if he's such a big problem that he's away from the team, listen, I'm not in the locker room. I don't know. I'll defer to your judgment on that if you're the Jets coaches. But if you're suiting him up for a game and you're giving him less snaps than Braxton Berrios and Jeff Smith, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And yes, I do think, you know, he's shown an ability to make plays with the ball in his hand. So I do think maybe once or twice a quarter, maybe once once or twice a half, you just do, you just get him the ball in space and you let him make a play. And that makes life easier on your quarterback, makes life easier on your team. Now, as far as Denzel Mims goes, should he, have a bigger role. I view Mims as kind of a backup receiver right now. I think he's got a limited route tree, I think, but I think he brings skills to the table. So again, part of coaching is knowing what a guy does well. Mims, I think is kind of a vertical threat. You know, he's not, a, I don't think he's super fast. Maybe if he gets build up speed, then he plays a little bit closer, closer to that four, three times speed, but you want to get him down, get it down the field, throw the ball up to him. And you also want to get him the ball on the run because he's a big guy. And he, you could see and that run he made after the catch Sunday, he was tough to bring down. So if Corey Davis is out, I think you should see a lot of Denzel Mims. And listen, you did see a lot of Denzel Mims on Sunday. So 
has he earned a right to? I mean, he's made one catch this. He's made one big catch this year, so I don't want to go crazy over it. But yeah, I think you see a skill set there that can help you out a little bit. So maybe we should see him a little bit more going forward. But you also have to remember Denzel Mims has made a lot of mistakes. I mean, Denzel Mims committed another penalty against Denver, so you know it's. It, I don't want to go too crazy about Denzel Mims' playing time. I think all of these are things that the Jets should probably do more. But the amount of time they're discussed, the the degree to which they're discussed is probably a little bit too much. Our next question, Ben Ijalana or Jeff Smith? So Ben Ijalana, if you're new to the podcast, was a third string lineman the Jets gave a $5 million contract to in the 2017 offseason. I have no idea why they did it to this day. I still can't tell you. I was drinking a soda when I read they signed the contract. Almost spit the soda on my laptop. It was a really weird con. And then he barely played after they gave him this five million. It's not like they gave him starter money, but they gave him money for, like really high salary for a swing tackle. I never understood it. That was one of the ongoing themes of the 2017 season on Locked On Jets. My frustration with the fact that Jets were paying this guy. Jets were essentially funding this guy's retirement to never play. Made no sense. And now we have Jeff Smith, who somehow is playing more than Elijah Moore. The answer is Jeff Smith, because... Jeff Smith's not making $5 million. Jets give Jeff Smith $5 million, then we're going to have a bigger problem here. We still have a we still have kind of a big problem, though. Our next question. I cannot say I fully bought the 5-2 and two record, but with multiple players out for the year, do you feel quote-unquote better coming out of the trade deadline with no real moves at 5-3 and three for a team still in rebuild mode versus a 6-2 and two team going all in? So I think the question is, the Jets were 6-2, and two, and they mortgage their future, would that be a worse situation than they are right now? You know, it depends on what they did. Now, if the Jets are going out there, and this is like the trade I, this is my template for like a really short-sighted trade this year, for trade that just, I'm all in, I don't care about the future. It's the Christian McCaffrey trade, because the 49ers essentially got rid of, they shed every draft pick that they had. I would feel better with the Jets where they are right now, standing pat, than I would if they were chasing a Super Bowl. If they said, you know, we're just trading all of our picks to try and get some one-star player. I would have liked to have seen it if it was possible the Jets to get somebody who could help them for the next couple of years, and I would have been fine giving up an early pick for something like that. I also would have been fine with the Jets trading a late-round pick for a guy who could fill a role. I don't know. I did not see anybody who changed teams yesterday where I said, wow, I really wish the Jets had made that trade. So... From that standpoint, I guess, yes. Listen, it's better to be 5-3 and three and have your eye on the horizon than it would be to be 6-2, and two, which is would be kind of a 6-2 you know, and two where they've had a lot of help along the way, and they're not really a team on Buffalo's level, yet they're mortgaging the future. I, I would not want that, but at the same time, I don't think Joe Douglas would think in that way. I, I don't think Joe Douglas was the type of guy who would completely mortgage the future based on what we've seen so far this year. So in some ways, I, I don't know that it's necessarily inaccurate. Yeah, I, I don't think it would be anything to worry about anyway. Speaking of Joe Douglas, there's been a lot of talk about his future over the last couple of weeks because a lot of his moves are working out. However, his handpicked quarterback is struggling. What could this possibly mean for him going forward? We'll, continue, we'll, we'll discuss this as we close out our Wednesday mailbag episode today. Well, if you're a daily fantasy sports player who had Der Garrett Wilson going for more than 90 yards on Sunday, you were probably pretty happy, even though the Jets lost. And if you are a daily fantasy player, let me tell you about prize picks. Here's how it works. You pick two to five players. If they score more or less than their prize picks projection, you can win 10 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize picks offers projections on any sport you want to watch. So if you don't want to have to take players who are going up against the Jets, you can maybe pick another sport. You can do NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball, the PGA, college football, college basketball, which begins shortly, soccer, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, and disc golf. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. There are safe and fast withdrawals, and they're currently operational in over 30 states and in Canada. So download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 using promo code LOCKEDON. So if you deposit $50, price picks gives you $50. If you deposit $100, price picks give you, gives you $100. Don't forget to enter promo code LOCKEDON, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, no space, at sign-in for an instant deposit match of up to $100. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Wednesday mailbag show. 
Our next question is about the job status of Joe Douglas. Have you seen enough from JD and this team that if Zach Wilson ends up being a bust, you are willing to let him and the regime have another shot at finding the quarterback of the future? I have not given up on Zach, but this is more a question about JD. Well, you know, you need to see how things go, but I think if the answer, if the question was asked today, I would say yes, because I think you've looked at it and you've seen him upgrade this roster. One of the things that's tricky about doing a podcast like this, because we're daily, we do a new episode each day, Monday through Friday for most of the year, you know, 10, 10 and a half months, and then, you know, a few episodes a week during the quiet time of the summer. So it adds up. It's maybe, I don't know, 200 episodes a year. You say the same thing a lot. And when it's something like executing a rebuild, it's a long time before you see the progress. So, you know, I spent two years saying, I think Joe Douglas kind of has a good path forward for the Jets, but it's taken to this point to actually see the fruits of his labor. And now you see that there's legitimate talent on this team. I mean, there's legitimate impact talent on this team. We talked about Brees. Garrett Wilson looks like he's a player. Elijah Vera Tucker looks like a keeper on the offensive line. On the defensive side of the ball, Quinn and, and he inherited Quinn and Williams, but Quinn and Williams is still there. Sauce Gardner looks like a star corner waiting to happen. DJ Reed's playing almost as good as Sauce. So there's legitimate talent on this team. And they got some supporting players who are playing pretty effectively, like a Michael Carter II, who Joe Douglas brought in. So lots good, lots of good happening. The general plan has made sense. I could change my mind if, you know, the next couple of weeks don't go that well, but I would be inclined to say yes. It's kind of interesting because, you know, we talked about this and I said it, you know, it was probably like a 90 to 95% chance that Zach Wilson determines Joe Douglas's fate because you, usually that's that's how it works. If you draft a quarterback early and he doesn't pan out, usually you get fired. That's un- it, It's not always fair. And the situation like this shows you why it's not always fair. But listen, if you hit on this much and you miss on a quarterback – I mean, would you like somebody else to run the team? God, finding a quarterback's really hard. So right now, I think you have to be positive about Joe Douglas. I think that he he's done enough right that, yeah, I think I would give him another chance. I, I think that he, he's done a good job. I, I think that in, you know, finding well, a quarterback may have, you know, maybe he missed on the quarterback. He's hit on a lot of other things, and the Jets are clearly in a better place than they were when he took over. Our next question, can people really blame Mike LaFleur if they have not watched the All-22 and don't know what the play calls are? Well, it depends on what you're talking about. So, you know, there are situations where maybe LaFleur, maybe an offensive coordinator should run instead of pass. I think that that's, you know, a situation where, you know, you can you don't need the All-22. If we're talking about player de- deployment, again, I don't know you need the All-22 for that. I think there are situations where the coordinator gets too much. Listen, when the young quarterback struggles, everybody, the first guy who gets blamed is always the coordinator, and everybody thinks they can call plays. I do think there are moments where you wonder, well, why wasn't this guy involved? Well, maybe he was in the progression, and the quarterback just didn't throw it to him. So I think sometimes the, the coordinator gets a little bit too much blame. I do think you can criticize a coordinator, though, without watching the All-22, because there are, there are things that are not there on the All-22. And sometimes you see exactly what the play is from the broadcast view. So I... I think you can i think that there are moments where maybe they get unfair criticism that only becomes clear when you're watching the all 22 but yes i do think you can make uh, i do think you can criticize an offensive coordinator without seeing the, the coach's film why do you hate tyler conklin so much okay the reason i love this question is it makes it sound like i'm sitting in my basement like plotting like ways i can bash tyler conklin on the podcast and it also makes it sound like it's more likely that I'm doing this than it is that Tyler Conklin just isn't playing well. That I'm just like coming up with this like conspiracy to make people think Tyler Conklin stinks. That's more likely than it is Tyler Conklin's just not doing a good job. Tyler Conklin played well on Sunday. I don't know Tyler Conklin. All I'm doing is saying I, I don't hate people I don't know. All I do is tell you if a guy plays well, I tell you he did well. If he does poorly, I tell you he does poorly. Tyler Conklin was good on Sunday against New England. If we have more games like that where you know he's running guys over and he's making plays everybody's gonna ask me why i guess the question that a few weeks i'll be getting a question why do you love tyler conklin so much i don't hate tyler conklin i don't know tyler conklin just telling you whether somebody's doing well or not and that's just my opinion um i i I don't i don't hate tyler conklin and our last question which do you think has been the bigger loss on the offensive side of the ball this year elijah vera tucker or Brees hall 
you know, a lot of people think it's Elijah Vera Tucker. I go with Brees, though. I mean, the offensive line they've had to reshuffle it a number of times. Elijah Vera Tucker. I think a lot. I think a lot of the people who vote for Vera Tucker and something like this are focused on the fact he played three positions. You know, he was able to move around. That versatility helps. But the Jets have had to reshuffle this offensive line a number of times. And even when Max Mitchell was in there, they were not getting great play at guard. Brees Hall just changed the offense. Brees Hall allowed the Jets to win games without having a passing attack. And you saw how things fell apart without him on Sunday, without him to carry the load, when other people had to carry the load. So uh, for me, it's Brees Hall. And that's no disrespect to Elijah Vera Tucker, who would, to me, be the second most important player on the offense this year. But I think Brees was a bigger deal. People disagree. I think I think the two things are, first of all, what I said about Vera Tucker playing multiple positions. But I think there's also the elements, you know, typically offensive lines are more important than, than running back. And this is an exception, though. Running back's not that important for the most part in today's NFL. Brees Hall was really important for the Jets. And he's going to be tough to replace. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so you'll never miss an episode. Give the show a five-star review if you're listening on a podcast source or a big thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. Have a great Wednesday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Jets.